You can be seated, but not for long, because it's Palm Sunday, and it's a celebration day, and in Palm Sunday, people are up, and they're hooting, and they're hollering, and we're going to do a little bit of that this morning, too, so I hope you're ready. When Isaac turned three years old, we had a birthday party for him, and the theme was donkey, That's right, we had a donkey party. I think we had a pinata that day, some other fun stuff. But the reason we had a donkey party was because Isaac's favorite song was the donkey song. And you're going to learn the donkey song if you don't know it. And I'm going to expect you to sing the donkey song because it's super easy to learn. And you can't sit down while you sing the donkey song. So if you can... Stand. I would invite you to stand as I teach you the donkey song. You're going to ride the donkey, right? Okay? That's how the first, the first line's really easy, and then it, get, it just keeps going next level. So ready? It says, here comes Jesus riding on a donkey. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. Here comes Jesus riding on a donkey. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna to the king. It's pretty easy, right? Now here we go. You ready? Jumping up and down, jumping up and down, jumping up and down, shout Hosanna. Hosanna. Jumping up and down, jumping up and down, jumping up and down, shout Hosanna. Hosanna. Here comes Jesus riding on a donkey. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. Here comes Jesus riding on a donkey. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. Jumping up and down, jumping up and down, jumping up and down, shout Hosanna, Hosanna. Jumping up and down, jumping up and down, jumping up and down, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hey, you did it. Good job. I had a microphone before I started that. <laughs> that was fun. It's a fun day, I imagine, Palm Sunday. Of course, the donkey song recounts the story that we remember today as we enter into Holy Week on our way to Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Today is Palm Sunday, Jesus' final week he enters Jerusalem to, work, uh, to finish the work that he came to do. The king has come. He's going to take his place, but not on a horse like a conquering king, like an invader, but humbly on the back of a donkey. His kingdom would not look familiar, but don't miss it. The king has come. This is the reading out of Luke chapter 19. After Jesus had said this, oh, by the way, I got it in my notes here too. When we get to like the exciting parts in this, like I, I have, you guys are going to be the crowd today, so you're not done having fun. Uh, kids, I invite you to stand on your chairs if you'd like. If you have a jacket and you want to swing it around a little bit, the throwing of clothes, the waving of branches, it's all part of the story. So if you feel like it, you, this is your place. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it, bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt. They put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and they spread them on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God 
in a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. And this is what they said. Why are you sitting? I don't think anybody was sitting that day. Come on, we got this. Yeah, I'll give you time to catch your breath in a second, right? This is what they said. And if I remember, yeah, there it is. It says they joyfully praised God with loud voices. Here we go. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Say it again. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. It was so crazy that the leaders were like, can you please have your people quiet? And Jesus said to the Pharisees, I tell you, if they keep quiet, even these stones will cry out. You can sit down. I won't make you stand up again (laughs) until the end. The king's come into his city. He's come to sit on his throne to take his place. And he's worthy of the praise of his people. And that's what we know of Palm Sunday. Jesus has come and Jesus is worthy. And we, with joyful praise and loud voices, Recount all the things he's done and say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. Palm Sunday was not the only time that a king made an entrance into Jerusalem in an unlikely manner. Um, The story of Palm Sunday in many ways harkens back to the way that David entered the city when he became king. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at that story. It's in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6. A little bit of backstory. David was pretty young when he was anointed king. And there was an other king that was on the throne. His name was Saul. And David would live most of his young life waiting for Saul's reign to end. And during that time, avoiding Saul's pursuit of his life. And the day's going to come when Saul and David's best friend Jonathan are going to fall in battle. That's how 1 Samuel ends. David grieves the, the loss of the king and the loss of his best friend. And you would think the next thing would be for the newly anointed king to take his throne. But that's not what happens. Because one of Saul's sons moves into the palace. And it's going to be seven and a half years before this day happens. Seven and a half years, David is going to be the anointed king after Saul and not be on his throne because of an imposter. We talked a little bit about this story earlier, back in the fall, if you remember. David defeats all these different armies. The final one is the Philistines. And they, and they get back the Ark of the Covenant. The one that Saul so foolishly lost in battle when he tried to manipulate the presence of God, thinking that all he needed was this box, and he could do whatever he wanted. And the Philistines took it, and, and then they had it, right? But, but David wins it back. Remember the story of Uzzah who touches it and then falls dead, and it scares David, and he's like, hold up. We're not going any further with this thing. And he knocks on the door of a guy named Obed-Edom. You remember this? And that's where the Ark of the Covenant is going to hang out for six months. And we remember the story because it says that while the Ark was there, the house of Obed-Edom and everything of his was blessed. And we talked earlier about the presence of of God and how this man, Obed-Edom, would chase the presence of God the rest of his life. Because he had experienced something that was really real, was truly true. It was the presence of God, and he didn't want to be anywhere else. Well, time's up at Obed Edom's house, and it's time for David to bring the ark and to go into Jerusalem. And this is the royal parade, and it starts in 2 Samuel chapter 6, uh, verses 12 to 15, is where I'm at. So David went up. To bring the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. 
<laughs> so nuts. Just these details are crazy. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Every six steps, they stop and they sacrifice a bull and a fattened calf. This is, David is going to go all out crazy for his, his parade in honoring the Lord. It's incredible. And there's David. He's wearing a linen ephod, and he's dancing before the Lord with all of his might. While he and all of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. Later, you read about his wife, Michael, who watches from, from their house, from the, from the palace, I guess. And she's like, what were you thinking? Do you know the story of Michael? She confronts him. She's like, oh, good job, Mr. King man. Distinguished. She actually says, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. Just dripping with sarcasm. Going around half naked in full view of slave girls. And he says to her in response, essentially, I was only dancing before the Lord and I will become even more undignified than this. I mean, it's a crazy thing. You can just see the people hollering and shouting and cheering and singing, loudly praising as the Ark of the Covenant's brought into the city. Every six steps, they're offering sacrifice. And, and King David is dancing around like a fool in a linen ephod. The underwear of a priest. And they brought the ark of the Lord and they set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. David, David wrote a song for this very moment. Psalm 24. He wrote in Psalm 24, Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory can come in. Sounds about right for a royal parade. Here he comes. Get ready. Lift up the gates. Here comes the king. Who is this king of glory? That's the next verse. The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Wait. Huh? David, David isn't the king. How could it be? This is the long-awaited royal parade. This is his coronation day, his triumphal entry. Seven and a half years in the waiting. And it's not about him. No, no, the chorus will repeat itself in order to make the point. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory can come in. Who is this king? This king of glory? It's the Lord, Yahweh, Almighty. He is the king of glory. David enters Jerusalem to a song of praise, one that praises the true king, the Lord Almighty. I don't know, how do you, how do you imagine a royal parade? Musicians, dancers, loud trumpets, banners, all the royal regalia. You guys have been to the castle for the Renaissance Fair. Maybe there was an army in your mind marching in lockstep, the show of the kingdom's military muscle. And the king, in my mind, maybe in yours, he's in the back and he's lifted high above and he's carried above the crowd. Of course, it's what everybody's there to see. It's his parade, but not this one. If any onlookers were expecting that, they got something very different. Instead of King David, Hoisted above the crowd, they found the Ark of the Covenant in his place. The intersection of heaven and earth. God's dwelling with his people. Remember, 
That's what the ark is. It's not just a golden box. It's where the very presence of God dwells. And it's always been his desire to be right in the middle of his people. The true king was taking his place where he had always belonged. And where was David? He was dancing around at the front of the parade, dressed in a linen ephod, the underwear of a priest, undignified, even foolish, but a holy foolishness, symbolically saying, I'm not the king coming to sit on a throne. I'm a priest coming to lead you into the presence of God. The absurdity of the day continues well into his reign. The end of the parade, what would you expect? I kind of imagine like the king, like walking up the stairs. You know, maybe, maybe he's in like this royal float and he's got to be like let down. Maybe there's a carpet that rolls out and he walks up, right, up to his throne, flanked on each side as he strolls up the steps of his palace to take his spot on the throne. It's not a crazy idea, but it's not what happens. Instead, the tabernacle is placed in a tent, a simple tent that David had prepared at the center of the city, a tent where anyone and everyone could come to worship and pray. It's a move that would be echoed in his priorities as king. I'll I'll read a bit from Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools, because Tyler does a really nice job explaining David's priorities. It says, after his entrance, David went into the palace. He sat down with his board of advisors and laid out the plan. David hired 288 worship leaders, prophets, and elders to pray and worship in that tent, presumably 24 hours a day. He was a king leading a military during an era of tribal warfare, and he just emptied the national savings account for prayer. Can you imagine the meeting where he laid out the strategic plan? Uh, Dave, uh, we're going to need to beef up our defenses against the armies that are literally surrounding us, and you want to spend it all on a prayer tent? Yeah, that's exactly right. And then he did it. For the 33 years of David's reign as Israel's king, worship and prayer took place 24 hours a day. David put prayer back at the very center of God's people, and he invited everyone, men, women, slave and free, Israelite and pagan. The 33 years of David's kingship were the only time before the resurrection that there were no restrictions on access to God's presence David's tabernacle was a New Testament reality in an Old Testament world. That's the scandal of the prayer tent. David's jaw-dropping first move was to put prayer at the center of God's people. That was either the most admirable or most ridiculous move a king could make, depending on if you lean more poet or pragmatist. But David's unconventional reign as king was the political high point of Israelites' history any way you measure it. Peace and safety in the city, prosperity in the economy, care for the poor, a divided kingdom united. David's priorities looked like a political disaster on paper, but he built his life radically on prayer and God took care of everything else. As David Fritsch writes, the presence of God was David's political strategy. The pattern that emerges from David's tabernacle is this. Prioritize the presence in the church and you get the kingdom in the city. What does it look like when the king takes his throne in the center of his people? And the primary task of his people is to worship him. What does it look like when the king takes his throne in the center of his people 
and the primary task of his people is to worship him. That's the question you have to ask yourself, MCC. You, all of you, were created for worship. You were created to worship. I could go any number of places to show this to you, and I'm not going to take the time to do that. Just know, you were created for worship. Ecclesiastes, the eternity has been set in the hearts of men. Like, there's no way around it. You are going to worship. You will worship something, and if he, if God doesn't have your whole heart, then something else does. There's no way around it. You're going to worship. You're made to worship. You're going to worship something, and if he's not the thing that's being worshipped, then something else is in his place. There is an imposter in the palace. But if he does have your whole heart, if he does have a David-like heart in his people, then watch out, world. I'll read the rest of Psalm 24 to you. In fact, it's the first part. The earth is the Lord's. Everything in it. The world, all who live in it, tis. For he founded it on the seas, and he established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has a clean heart, pure heart, clean hands, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. It's like David, even at his coronation, knew what the priority had to be. The priority had to be a people with clean hands and a pure heart. Pure. Think think like pure gold, pure silver. Not pure as in like don't make mistakes, but pure as in you have one thing in your heart. Like pure gold is only gold. It's pure. Clean hands, a pure heart. There's only one thing this people wants. It's only one desire in them. And they don't trust in idols. And they don't swear by false gods. They will receive the blessing. The Lord God will be their Savior. That's the generation we're looking for. For those who seek Him. Who seek your face. O God of Jacob. Yeah. Yeah. What does it look like when the king takes his throne in the center of his people and they make it their primary task to worship him and only him? You know, Jesus, he strolled into Jerusalem that day on a donkey and it was quite a party, but there's a lot of heartbreak on the day too. Because when David goes into Jerusalem, he finds... Something he did not expect, apparently. And what he sees breaks his heart. The celebration turns to weeping. Things aren't as they should be. And so he gives a prophetic word against the city for its destruction. And then he enters the temple and he finds the place that's supposed to be a house of prayer for the nations. Has been turned into a den of robbers. This wasn't the way it was supposed to be. This wasn't David's dream for his people. Yahweh dwelling like he did in the tabernacle at the heart of his people. It was so far from David's dream. So far from Jesus' desire for God's people.
This is a bit of a farewell for now. I'll be back next week, but I don't want to talk about anything but Jesus next week. Uh, A final word from your friend. Remember, that's what I wanted to be over our time together, a companion. I wanted to walk with you and share with you. So today, I thought, how do I wrap this whole thing up? And this is the story I wanted to share. I don't know how you're feeling about the future. I will tell you, I like the plan. I really like it. I think it's really, really great that you would put a priority on your kids and on the families. I think that's how you look to the future and you build the church. I think it's a good plan. I I like that you're going to have people coming in from out of town to share with you. These can be really high quality teaching face to face. You're going to get the best of what these guys got. I think it's a great plan. All right? I want to affirm that to you. And I have a lot of confidence in you. I know you. I know MCC. I know the character of people in this room. I know your desire and your heart, your love for people, your love for the community, your love for the Word of God. I know this. But those two things, a good plan, really excellent people, They aren't enough. You need something more, something deeper, something more lasting. And so let this be my word to you as we think about David and his priorities. I would echo and say, make prayer and worship your priority, your only task your only passion, wholehearted desire to be in the presence of God, each of you, individually, and all of you together, to know him, to listen to his voice, to desire to see him glorified, If that is who you set yourself to be, church, I have full confidence that you won't fail in your pursuit to honor God and see his kingdom come around you. Each of you, a house of prayer, a place where the spirit of God lives and is free to move and from which Jesus sees His spirit move in the world. The presence of Jesus. Your only agenda. So may the God of hope May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you could overflow with hope by the power, by the power of the Holy Spirit.